Good morning. I'm Stephen Lee. I'm an elder at First Presbyterian Church in Mesquite, Texas. And I'm also the teacher of the Discipleship Sunday School class there. Today we continue with our study of the Gospel of John. And I'd like to remind you that our curriculum is based upon the Daily Bible Study Series by Professor William Barclay and that we're used in the new Revised Standard Version of the Bible for our scripture readings. Now last week, Jesus was eating the last meal with his disciples and he singled Judas out as the one who was to betray him. And in that last dramatic scene of our scripture last week, Judas left the room. And that's where we begin this week. We have two scripture readings in this lesson today. The first one is John 13, verses 31 through 32. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. This passage tells us of a fourfold glory. First, the glory of Jesus has come, and that glory is the cross. The tension is gone. Any doubts that remained have finally been removed. Judas has gone out, and the cross now is a certainty. Here we are face to face with something which is the very foundation of life. The greatest glory in life is the glory which comes from sacrifice. In warfare, the supreme glory belongs not to those who survive, but to those who lay down their lives. It's the simple lesson of history that those who have made the greatest sacrifices have entered into the greatest glory. Second, in Jesus, God has been glorified. It was the obedience of Jesus which brought, brought glory to God. There's only one way for people to show that they love and admire and trust a leader, and that is by their obedience. The only way in which children can honor their parents is by obeying them. Jesus gave the supreme honor and the supreme glory to God because he gave to God the supreme obedience, even to death upon a cross. Third, in Jesus, God glorifies himself. It's a strange thought that the supreme glory of God lies in the incarnation of Jesus and his death upon the cross. There's no glory like that of being loved. Had God remained aloof and majestic, serene and unmoved, untouched by any sorrow and unhurt by any pain, men and women might have feared him and they might have admired him, but they would not have loved him. The law of sacrifice is not only the law of earth, it's the law of heaven and earth. It's in the incarnation and the cross that God's supreme glory is displayed. Fourth, God will glorify Jesus. Here's the other side of the matter. At that moment, the cross was the glory of Jesus, but there was more to follow. The resurrection, the ascension, the full and final triumph of Christ is what the New Testament means when it talks of his second coming. In the cross, Jesus found his own glory, but the day came and the day will come when that glory will be demonstrated to all the world and all the universe. The vindication of Christ must follow his humiliation. The enthronement of Christ must follow his crucifixion. The crown of thorns must change into the crown of glory. The king is yet to enter into a triumph which all the world can see. Our second passage today is John 13, 33 through 35. 
Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you should love one another just as I have loved you. You should all also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. That verse right there is called the new commandment. And it's one of those verses that we should underline in our Bibles. Jesus was laying down his farewell commandment to his disciples. The time was short. If they were to ever hear his voice, they must hear it now. He was going on a journey all alone. He was taking a road that he had to walk alone. And before he went, he gave them the commandment that they must love one another as he had loved them. What does this mean for us and for our relationships with one another? How did Jesus love his disciples? First, he loved them selflessly. Even in the noblest human love, there remains some element of self we so often think, and maybe unconsciously, of what we are to receive. Or we think of the happiness we will receive, or of the loneliness we will suffer if love fails or if love is denied. So often we are thinking, what will this love do for me? So often at the back of things, it is our happiness that we are seeking. But Jesus never thought of himself. His one desire was to give himself and all he had for those he loved. Second, Jesus loved sacrificially. There was no limit to what his love would give or to where it would go. No demand that could be made upon it was too much. If love meant the cross, Jesus was prepared to go there. Third, Jesus loved his disciples understandingly. He knew his disciples through and through. And we never really know people until we have lived with them. When we are meeting them occasionally, we see them at their best. It's when we live with them that we find their weaknesses. Jesus had lived with his disciples for many months, and he knew all that was to be known about them. And yet, he still loved them. Now, sometimes we say that love is blind, but that is not so, for blind love ends in disillusionment. It loves not what it imagines people to be, but what they are. The heart of Jesus is big enough to love us as we are. Fourth, Jesus loved his disciples forgivingly. Their leader, Peter, was to deny him and they were all to forsake him in his hour of need. They never really understood him. They were blind and insensitive, slow to learn, and lacking in understanding. In the end, they were miserable cowards. But Jesus held nothing against them. There was no failure which he could not forgive. The love which is not learned to forgive will shrivel and die. We are poor creatures, and we hurt those who love us best. For that reason, love must be built on forgiveness, for without forgiveness, it is bound to die. Thanks for joining me this morning. God bless each and every one of you.